a hit chart. And um, what I'm going to do on each video is just answer a question and maybe give a little background. Hope it helps. And, uh, you know, my information that I'm sharing is my story. And my only intent is to share with you my story and the takeaways that I had from it. Maybe somewhere along the way it connects with you or makes sense to you. So if there is anything that I say that comes across as anything less than just wanting to leave you better than I found you, I'll apologize now. So my first question is, um, why do I attract narcissists? And <clears throat> it's almost like um, opposites attract, opposite ends of, um, um, you know, how magnets get together. It is just in our personality style. And when you can go back and connect the dots of what made you you, then you have a better idea of what you're attracting. And I know in my own case, when I was able to connect that my children's father was a narcissist, I didn't know it when I divorced him. I just knew that this wasn't what I wanted my kids growing up seeing, the dynamics of... Um, I just couldn't do anything right. I couldn't make him happy. Everything I did was wrong and he was always putting me down and I mean almost treating me like a child but he was acting like a child himself. And um, and there's gonna be a lot more videos on that because it is not easy to co-parent with a narcissist ever. But you can do it. I've got three very happy, successful children today because of it. Um, my second husband, I was single for eight years, had thought I had worked through all of my issues, had my head on pretty straight, had a really good, fulfilling life, and met my Prince Charming and um, got swept off my feet, met him in May, and by January of the following year, we were engaged, and at the one, one and a half year mark, we were married, and it was about six months into the marriage that I, we didn't live together before we got married. We went through and actually he went through my church and took the classes and kind of put that mask on for a long time. And then about six months after we got married, um, took it off. And I remember as soon as he took it off, it was like, crap, I did it again. <laughs> and, um, at the time, what I now know is that there was still some work there. Obviously I hadn't done. And, um, and it was very codependent me of me at the time, but I was really, really torn apart from, from divorcing him because I had thought that I truly loved him and, and I did truly love him. Well, I'm sorry. I loved a person that didn't exist, but I truly did love that person that didn't exist. And I thought that's who I married, but, um, I started studying, um, narcissism then to kind of get my feet back on the ground to make sure, because there was a lot of uh, gaslighting going on, there was a lot of uh, passive aggressive stuff, and um, there was a lot, so there was a lot that I had to separate out um, to know exactly what was mine to work on and what was his. And so in a very codependent way, I had started studying um, narcissistic parenting styles because I thought if I studied maybe parenting dynamics, I would have a better understanding of where he came from. And it was through that process of studying narcissistic parenting styles to figure out my ex, so it was completely for him, that I stumbled across seeing some examples that it was like, oh, oh, wow. Um, I found my own parents in those dynamics. And that's when I was really able to start connecting dots that my mother was a narcissist. And when narcissists have children, they typically have one of two different types of relationships with these children. They're either going to make golden child or they're going to make scapegoat child. And they're opposite ends of the equation. And as you can see, uh, the golden child, well, I'll explain to you, the golden child will grow up to more than likely repeat the pattern and be narcissist. And the scapegoat child will uh, grow up to be very codependent and uh, maybe in my case, I'm very empathetic, I, I'm an empath, and, um, and they're opposite ends. Now, let me get a little bit deeper into the details of what makes each one and know that um, this is just for my own study and I haven't gone to college to get any of this, but it made sense and I was able to apply it and see it in my own life to, un to make sense of it all. And so an, a golden child at a very young age learns that in order to get love or attention from the parent, they have to turn off what they normally feel to do what that parent wants them to do. So they're almost like puppets. And so um, a, a story I'll share is growing up. I have memories of my mom sitting on a sofa telling my sister how to beat me up. 
and to punch me and to throw my face on the ground and to do this and to do that. And at the time, my sister didn't want to do it, but my sister, in search of getting love from our mother, kind of put that on the back burner and did those things because she, that's how she got love from her mom. And, and so what happens is eventually, and it, and it happens at a young age, and then they just get better at it, but eventually what happens is they don't know how to be them because they've never been allowed to be them. And so you, you get these adults that act like three or four year olds and do passive aggressive stuff. I know my ex-husband, I was doing a 16th birthday party at, um, at our house for my daughter and he hid all the remotes in the house, but didn't tell us that he hid all the remotes in the house. In, and a lot of the things in the house wouldn't work without remotes because there was a theater system and stuff. And so we had this big party going on and we couldn't do the things that we had planned. So it's very passive aggressive and kind of setting you up. It's almost like having another child in the house. And so it's because they didn't learn at a young age to express themselves because if they did, they got in trouble. And, and, and so eventually what happens is they turn that self, that part of them off and now what they're doing is they're always looking to another person to find their identity. And when they were younger, it was always in what their parents wanted them to do. But as, we be as they become adults, what happens is they're attracted to impasse and codependence as much as we're attracted to them. Because we make it very easy for them to know who to be. So me at the other end of the equation, as a scapegoat, what I learned is I, I was never good enough. I never did anything right, and that my definition of love was neglect. So the guy that didn't call me back when I got older and dating, the guy that didn't call me back was the one I couldn't stop thinking about. The one who ignored me, which is incredibly unhealthy now looking back, but I just didn't know it. I just know it felt familiar because that was how I got love growing up. And, um, and, and, and that through that, I also was, I mean, I have memories of at a very young age, probably four, three or four, I remember being at a family picnic and walking into a room and there was just people all the way around on both sides. Maybe it was raining outside, I don't know. And um, I remember walking into that room and I felt, I had to learn to read my mom at a very young age because if I didn't read it right, I got beat. And if I did read it right, I mean, and I had to almost change at a, at a second's notice to be able to go with it because if she was in a bad mood, I got to get out of there. If she was in a great mood, then I might be able to stop and enjoy it. But usually if she was in a, a good mood, then she would do something to me that was kind of mean that would put her in a better mood. And, um, and so I learned at a really young age to kind of read the energy and kind of read people. And I didn't realize how much that would help me in later years, but this is kind of explaining what a scapegoat does. And I remember being four years old, walking into this room, and something inside of me wanted me to leave the room. I wanted to run in that moment, and I didn't. I, my mom had actually called me, and as soon as she called me, I wanted to run, and I didn't. And I went over to her, and she said something really kind of, you know, not very nice, but it was something about... I know a common thing that she would do is how far would you have gotten if I didn't call you back here? Kind of a control thing. And I, I think that's what she said is how far would you have been if I hadn't called you back here? And so as I turned to go leave, she actually deep pantsed me in the middle of this room in front of all these family members. And, and my embarrassment in the moment was just kind of running out of the room crying and hearing her laugh. And so I was the butt of a lot of entertainment for her and her energy as she grew up. So then when I get into the dynamics of dating and I haven't made these connections yet or gotten this clarity yet, what my definition of love is, is very unhealthy. And so then I meet my, my future husband, husbands actually, and I am this open book because I believe in people and I always see the good in people and I always want to forgive. And I know when I was um, in my 30s, I was going through a divorce for, uh, with my children's father and my mother had actually gone out and opened credit cards in my name in a different state. And it took some time for me to piece it together because this was before the internet, believe it or not. And by the time I confronted her with it, and I asked her, why? Out of all of your children, I'm the one that is going through a divorce right now. Why are you opening credit cards in my name and, and trying to run my credit? And she said, because I knew you would forgive me. And so we teach people how to treat us. So when I meet my ex-husband, uh, ex-husbands, 
I, 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 I want to believe the best. I want to forgive them because that is what I do. She knew I would forgive her because that's what I've always done. And so I become an open book and I let you know what it's going to take to date me, what it's going to take to woo me, what it's going to take to be my Prince Charming. And, and, and they become that very quickly because they are feeding off my energy and my positiveness and also just my genuineness because they don't know how to be that. They're the exact opposite. And so it is a very, very, very um, tangled mess that you, you know, that gets created, and um, and and also being the, I'm a recovering codependent. I'm not a codependent anymore, but at the time, an incredibly codependent person, where my identity was found in how happy my husband was. If he wasn't happy, my gosh, I spent the next day trying to do everything I could to make him happy. And eventually, after years and years and having some really good, strong people around me, what I realized is there is nothing on my best day that I can do that would ever make him happy. And back then, at the time when I got divorced from him, I didn't divorce him because I am the woman I am today. At the time, I divorced him because I loved him so much that I thought if I can't make him happy, at least he can go be happy with someone else. Very codependent. And, and it all worked out. I just knew that it didn't feel right inside of me. So why do I attract narcissists? It's because we, it, it goes both ways. And, and so some of the litmus things on, it's very, 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 very hard to see through the facade and the mask of a narcissist, if not near impossible because they get better with age two. And so some of the litmus of how can you spot a narcissist? I'm going to give you a few, okay? One is time. Slow things down. Because actions speak louder than words. So watch the actions. And there's no rush to, to, to rush into something. If they're trying to rush into something and they're not respecting your boundaries, that is a very red, big red flag right there, okay? Is that that's what narcissists do. They don't see you as separate people. They see you an extension of themselves. They wanna rush through this because it takes a lot of energy to pretend to be something you're not. And we've given them the script they need to play. And I know my script is a really good script. And so they wanna rush you through that. Don't rush it. The other thing is, see how they talk about other people. If they always are victims, if they can't dissect a situation and kind of take accountability for their part, I know with my uh, second husband that I, I share the last name with, um, he, when I met him, he was still playing a victim role because he had said that his ex-wife had um, an affair on him. And it was like, you know, 12, 13, 14 years later. And I had asked him one day, I said, you know, I am so sorry that you went through that, but what I know is typically if somebody is um, cheating in a marriage, there was something there that was missing or she wasn't getting something from you because you don't go to bed, you don't go and mess around on somebody you're connected with. So, you know, it, it's been a few years, get over that initial hurt, but have you looked back and saw maybe what happened or what was changing in the relationship that made you... Um, that maybe she wasn't getting because while I don't mess around in relationships, I'm also not so arrogant or stupid to think that if we don't figure out what that was, that I wouldn't be her someday. And I remember he was like, nobody's ever asked me that. And so for that whole time, everybody that he allowed around him, and that's what they do is they, they surround themselves with apath people or flying monkeys who are usually not or never more successful than them or never somebody who steps up to question and ask harder questions like that. And, um, and he actually said that he was going to go and ask his ex-wife. And when she, well, I guess when he asked her, she hung up on him. So I imagine that she had probably said this time and time and time and time and time and time and time again. And here it is, you know, 10, 15 years later and he's asking her and that would probably hurt. So, uh, I can, I can imagine she was very frustrated, but they don't take accountability. They're always victims. There's nothing that they did that was ever their fault. And they will also, <clears throat> when they retell themselves the story, so my mother, when she went out and opened credit cards in my name, in the moment I had her backed into a corner, she admitted it in that moment to me, apologized and told me why. But as soon as the next day came, when they reprogram themselves with the lie or the story that they can live with and they repeat it to themselves three or four times, that now is their reality. I mean, they completely reprogram themselves. And I remember hearing it and seeing it when I grew up when my mom would retell stories. And I remember thinking, that's not exactly how that story went down. 
but it makes her look bigger or better or um, she didn't take um, her part of owning a situation, but that was normal for me growing up and, and, and it continued on to my adult life. So just know that, um, you know, slow things down. Um, uh, there's a movie, Goodwill Hunting, have them watch it. When you're dealing with somebody who doesn't know how to feel feelings, they're not going to get the movie and they're just going to kind of be lost and they're not even going to be able to fake their way through it. So um, there are some litmus out there, but I think the most important one is to make sure that you're at a healthy place and that your feet are firmly planted and that you've got a pretty balanced life so that when if you come across another one, they're not so easy to get in because there's usually easier prey, you know, a lot of when you have a house and you put a security system on or you put signs in the yard, it's not necessarily to make bad crime go away. It's just to go to a easier house to break into, just not mine. And the narcissist will do that too. Is they, they can only keep up that facade for so long. So if you were wondering why you attract narcissists, I hope this helps you get some clarity on uh, what's going on there and know that you could really dive in and dissect and, and, and know that the narcissist really is just a hurting child inside of them. And, and why we have that hurting child, that, that, that hurting child inside of us also, we found ways to nurture and love and continue on through it, and they haven't. So it's, it's actually a really sad existence, but uh, it is a choice, and, uh, and you can tell because we choose not to have it. So if you guys are wondering, why do you attract narcissists? No, it's not you. It's just the dynamics of how we were raised because we're actually both injured children at the end of the spectrum and we go together. So hope this helps. Remember you guys, I believe that we are all, all, all connected. And hopefully from telling you this, I believe that we all have gifts inside of us that the world needs. And uh, we're spending so much energy trying to figure all this out. Hopefully I can help you a little bit so you can go claim it, give it because we're all connected and we're all so powerful. So use your noggin to figure it out. Know that you are so loved. Have a great night and I'll talk to you next time.